This podcast is made possible through listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. And the Florence County Museum, presenting Kindred Spirit, The Personal Worlds of William H. Johnson, exploring the painter's artistic evolution and journey of self-discovery from rural South Carolina to Europe and New York, flocomuseum.org. From South Carolina Public Radio, this is Walter Edgar's Journal. I'm Walter Edgar, welcoming you to our podcast series about South Carolina culture and history with a nod to all things Southern. Today, Alfred Turner and I will be talking with Claudia smith Branson about her book, Injustice in Focus, The Civil Rights Photography of Cecil Williams. Cecil Williams is one of the few Southern black photojournalists of the civil rights movement. Born and raised in Orangeburg, South Carolina, Williams worked at the center of emerging 20th century civil rights activism in the state, and his assignments often exposed him to violence perpetrated by white law officials and ordinary citizens. Williams' story is the story of the civil rights era. Cecil Williams documented in pictures the civil rights activism in the 1940s through the 1960s in South Carolina. Injustice in Focus features 80 of Williams' photographs, accompanied by Brinson's rich research, interviews, and prose to offer a first-hand account of South Carolina's fight for civil rights and to tell the story of Williams' life behind the camera. Claudia, it's wonderful to have you back on the journal again. Delighted to be talking about your latest book, Injustice in Focus, The Civil Rights Photography of Cecil Williams. It is a very interesting and I would say eye-opening book. It's not your first foray into writing about the civil rights movement, right? That's right. Um, I left the paper and newspaper. I worked at the state paper for many years in 2006 to teach at Columbia College with the hopes of finishing a book that I did finish called Stories of Struggle, The uh, Clash Over Civil Rights in South Carolina. And that book came about because in my journalism career, I met many black elders. And by black elders, I mean people who were active in civil rights in the 30s, for example. And um, their story of South Carolina proved to me that South Carolina was not moderate, as it likes to claim to be, and that the true story of South Carolina did not really exist accurately because all these events and um, experiences by the black elders were left out. And so it became very important to me to think about a way to preserve that. And so over time, that became not just um, writing about people from the past for the paper, but also um, creating a book. And that has just continued to be my quest. And I, I think of myself still as a a form, as a former journalist, um, but I think of what I'm doing with writing about the civil rights movement more as almost a spiritual mission. I know that might sound a little odd, but I feel deeply that we need to know as many stories as we can to know what happened and then know who we are now and who we want to be. And so if important stories are missing, then um, something's missing from our lives. Well, I think I know a lot about South Carolina history, but there's there's some things in this book that I learned, and I had already gotten inklings of it from doing teachers' institutes and particularly African-American teachers talking about what their parents were doing in the 30s and 40s. Some people, in fact, there was a, a book done about South Carolina civil rights in the 1960s and basically said the NAACP didn't have much effect or whatever. Uh, and that was a go-to book uh, for, a, long, you know, for a, a few years. But the African-American community was mobilizing in South Carolina or organizing in South Carolina during the 1930s. Reading your book, I was reminded of the 1950s television show, A View or There, which took you back very vividly to the Battle of, of Gettysburg or the landing at Plymouth Rock. And this has a, a style, Claudia, that really draws you in. It really draws you in, and particularly to the Orangeburg community, the strength of the African-American community in reacting to the world in which they found themselves in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. 
Well, I, w- when I do public talks, one of the things I ask people in the audience who are of a certain age to think about is, why didn't I know about this? And that can be true with both white and black audiences. And I ask myself that a lot, too. Why, why don't we know these stories? Um, there are multiple answers. I, I can touch on just a very few. Um, one is many of the stories are very personal and um, disturbing because of the violence and aggression of white supremacy. And so the stories weren't told publicly often, and they weren't told to grandchildren or children either. They were deeply held. Um, But when I was meeting people in their later years, they realized their importance. And when I approached them, they understood that they had a gift to give, and um, it was time to give it. So I was a recipient. I think another um, reason here, and it makes me very uncomfortable as a former journalist, is that most papers were owned uh, by—this was a time when there weren't large chains. Papers were owned by local people who were often segregationists, and they weren't about to give the NAACP or uh, the Congress of Racial Equality or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee any what they call publicity. And some of the papers, like the Sumter paper, actually put White Citizens Council editorials on their front page. So uh, there wasn't an avenue in South Carolina in terms of news for uh, black people to express uh, their concerns or their viewpoints. Uh, even in the very late 60s, like with the Charleston Hospital strike, when I would look at those stories, uh, Robert E. Lee was used as a metaphor that uh, uh, the, the president of MU, what's now MUSC, was, which was then Medical College Hospital, William McCord, was called you know, a Confederate general, and uh, the black strikers were called a black spear from Africa, and the strikers were never interviewed. Their viewpoint was never, ever put in the newspaper. Only the the white protagonists, if you want to call it that, were quoted. So there uh, was a bias to where information was collected, and there was a prohibition to certain information being published. Well, you know, I was too young at the time to understand anything about that strike, but having been alive then, I find that language not only troubling, but that's remarkable to me. But it wasn't uncommon throughout the Southeast to have that kind of editorializing it, it, in the news? It was not regional. It was it was national uh, for, the, for the most part. Uh, and one of the things that this book and some others have done is, for example, the bus boycott. Everybody looks to Rosa Parks. There was a bus boycott here in Columbia and a very successful one in Rock Hill that put the bus company out of business before there was a Rosa Parks. And so because the stories were not known, did not get much PR, everybody looks to Rosa Parks. The same thing with sit-ins that began in the 1960s. They talk about it starting in North Carolina and moving out. Well, South Carolina, particularly in some communities, African-Americans have been using sit-ins, wait-ins, for a number of years, but that when it was picked up by the national media, it was starting in, in North Carolina. Even the black press, particularly Jet Magazine, would get stories, but they seemed to be focused more on Alabama or Mississippi than what was going on in South Carolina. And I found that a little bit disturbing as well. It's, it's very interesting to think about why those sorts of things happen. So, for example, um, children uh, with the NAACP uh, were doing some sit-ins in the 40s, and Washington, D.C. had sit-ins that led to desegregation there in the late 40s and early 50s. And in Orangeburg, uh, the students at South Carolina State and Claflin were doing sit-ins in 1955. Uh, This was part of uh, a very large movement in Orangeburg after the second Brown versus Board decision and petitions where petitioners were being punished. And uh, the white uh, Citizens Council encouraged businessmen or, or, or pushed businessmen to uh, fire their employees, to call in loans, to kick sharecroppers off land. It's called the squeeze. Yes, the squeeze or the freeze, which is so evocative. It so clearly describes what they were doing. And so there were very strong leaders there, including Matthew McCollum, who was one of the founders of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, SCLC, um, who came up with a boycott where they pushed back. And what they did was they uh, took all the shoppers to Columbia once a week, 
and they refuse to shop downtown with any member of a white citizens council or buy products from anybody who is a white citizen council member and a distributor. So Sunbeam Bread, Paradise Ice Cream, Coca-Cola. And uh, the Coca-Cola boycott, by the way, went nationwide. And so that was very successful because one of the things that the citizen council members hadn't thought through was two-thirds of their customers were black. So these people that they were punishing economically could respond economically. And, and so those leaders were uh, invited to Montgomery to advise before the bus boycott happened. So there, as you pointed out, there are many, many things happening in South Carolina. And Cecil Williams, whose photography is the reason for this book, with 80 of his photographs in there, it's one of his pet peeves. He likes to say that with Briggs versus Elliott, the first lawsuit that led to Brown v. Board of Education, and with the boycott in 55, that South Carolina was leading the civil rights movement and guiding it. And um, one could even argue first in some activities. Again, that is a result of a lack of publicity or, or, or general knowledge. The black community, again, particularly in Orangeburg, had an underground newspaper, The Torch, uh, and you have a a copy as an illustration in here, but it published the names of individuals who uh, were being affected by the squeeze or who had, had accomplished something. It really was a focus on the black community in Orangeburg getting the word out because this wasn't just, I'm going to send this to Claudia Smith. You're going to get it and you're going to pass it on to somebody else, which is the way the black network operated. And I guarantee you that there were copies in every black beauty shop and every black barber shop. That was the focus of information in the African-American community. Yeah, I was read and pass it along. There was also um, a list of the merchants that were being boycotted. And if you changed your mind, you could drop off that list. And uh, one of the leaders, James Sultan, uh, for the rest of his life, carried a copy of that list in his wallet. Other ways that the torch supported the movement was being arrested became what Cecil calls a badge of honor. They would list everybody who had been arrested um, in the past several days, depending on, as you pointed out, when the when the torch came out, which is pretty much weekly. And so it was good to have your name on that list because that meant you were active in the movement. And this included children. Yes, that they have children eight, ten years old participating in marches, sit-ins and the like. One of the myths that was always put out is outside agitators are causing problems. I think the black community found that really offensive because it was an assumption then that the oppression they were experiencing did not exist and that it was people coming from outside to tell them they were oppressed. But uh, people knew their lives weren't what they should be. Because of the great migrations, most people in South Carolina had relatives elsewhere. And so they could see better lives. Uh, for example, Cecil Williams had uh, several relatives that were living much better lives than they could have in South Carolina in New York City. There was a policeman in the family, for example. And he and his family would go up regularly to New York City to visit. So they would see a life that, while not truly desegregated, was far more open than the life they were, they were living. And, of course, at the same time, there were issues within the African-American community, particularly with the president of South Carolina State. Dr. Benner Turner, he is such a complicated figure, and there's a, a San Jose University, San Jose State University professor, uh, Travis Boyce, who's just written a book about Benner Turner. So Benner Turner uh, was a lawyer who had not had the opportunity to practice law because uh, through shenanigans in North Carolina, his test scores were lost more than once. He worked in uh, real estate, for example, and worked in an office, a law office, not as a lawyer, and then was hired after... South Carolina State added a law school because the legislature did not want to desegregate the University of South Carolina. And he became the dean of that law school and then president of South Carolina State. The students found him aloof and autocratic. They were often very upset with him because uh, this was a time when in loco parentis was well and alive. And so 
he controlled who was on student publications. He controlled student offices. He uh, controlled student hours. You had to go to uh, church. And uh, he had a chauffeur-driven limousine and a beautiful house and didn't socialize with the students or the faculty whatsoever. And also, and this is sort of interesting, he looked white and there was constant suspicions, although never any proof, that he would choose to pass at, as white in other places. So he had a very difficult life because his students were alienated from him and he was controlled by an entirely white board of trustees who were segregationists, wanted to keep South Carolina State small, were not invested in an excellent education for black students. And so uh, it was sort of like a pauper going to ask the legislature, you know, for any support. And Clemson University, which would have been the white equivalent, got 10 and more times money than South Carolina State ever did. And this would become an accreditation problem, too, because if the buildings were in bad shape, if the professors weren't paid enough and you couldn't get good enough professors, then you couldn't get the accreditation and your students couldn't graduate with the pride and success that they desired. And what happened once students began to become active uh, in terms of civil rights protests? Dr. Turner kicked him out of school. Yes. In 55, when the uh, community had started the boycott, uh, the students at South Carolina State uh, and Claflin discovered that many of the products in their cafeteria that they were expected to eat were provided through the distribution of um, the mayor, Mayor Jennings, Robert Jennings Jr., who had distribution power over bread, ice cream, soft drinks. And so they decided to stage protests in their cafeterias where for a couple days in a row, they took their trays of food and just dumped the food in the trash can. Um, They went outside to sing. Now, Cecil Williams was in on this. He was young. He was tuned in. And there's some beautiful photographs of the students on campus um, singing outside the cafeteria in protest. Uh, Fred Henderson Moore was the leader. He was the student body president. And he has an interesting background. His mother was a street crier. These were people who would um, call out in the street to let people know they were passing by with their products. She would win the street crier contest because she was so good. His father worked at the shipyard but died when Fred was very young. Fred was really, really smart and got a scholarship to South Carolina State. And I should add here that um, the majority of students were often first-generation students. So this was really, really important to go to college because it was going to not only help you, but your entire family. And so Fred was a point of pride for his Charleston um, and Island uh, residents and relatives. He did not back down. Benner Turner called him into his office and even offered to help him get into a prestigious law school. Benner Turner had gone to Harvard. And Fred continued on. And so uh, the board of trustees was extremely unhappy with what was going on there. And uh, Benner Turner agreed that Fred and 14 other students who were participating would be expelled. Fred Henderson Moore landed on his feet despite what Turner did. Fred went on to uh, Allen University, which is a private uh, black college in Columbia, finished his degree there, and then went to Howard University and became a civil rights attorney and came down to, back down to South Carolina and was one of the attorneys for the strikers in the Charleston Hospital strike. So we're talking about during this time when the students are beginning the protests with the cafeteria. That's about what, 1955? 55, 56. 56. How old was Cecil Williams then? So Cecil is present, always present. When they're marching downtown in 55 for the boycott, he's there. He's taking pictures of long lines of well-dressed students marching downtown. In 55, 56, when um, the strike on campus is going on, he's there. So, for example, Benner Turner denies uh, a report that he has been hanged in effigy, as has a legislator. Cecil has the pictures. Uh, (laughs) And so Cecil, uh, I should add here, began his photographic career as a child, And I do mean a child. He had a baby brownie special, and he was taking pictures around his household. 
He had a relative who was encouraging him, and his parents were encouraging him. They got him a better camera. He shot a couple of weddings Mm -hmm. and made some money, and this interested him. Uh, And then he started taking pictures at Edisto Gardens, and so he became known in town. He was uh, attractive, smart, polite, well-mannered, and skilled. And so people wanted to encourage this child, and he was put into a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Shadrach Squire Morgan, who was an attorney who had gone to Howard University and was the local attorney for Thurgood Marshall, who was called Mr. Civil Rights, the lead attorney for the NAACP. Um, He knew that Thurgood Marshall was coming into town in 1950 and then again in 1951 for the Briggs versus Elliott trial and for hearings with the judge. And he asked Cecil's parents if he could take Cecil down to take a photograph of Thurgood Marshall. Cecil went down with his uh, camera and one flash bulb. This was back when you had like a, a light bulb in uh, an attachment to your camera to cast light. This is nothing like the digital cameras that we think of today. And uh, those flash bulbs were really, really expensive. So he had one flash bulb, one chance, and he got a gorgeous picture that's now in museums. It shows Thurgood Marshall in his trench coat and his hat and a worn Samsonite suitcase sort of poised, not posed, but poised on the steps of the train from New York. And uh, that really began Cecil's career. So he's in 11, 12, or 13, somewhere, we aren't quite sure um, when this happens. And then uh, in 56, he's a few years older. He's still a teenager, and he's taking these wonderful photographs. And eventually, he opens his own photography business in Orangeburg, uh, and he makes his living because of the world of segregation, doing photographs for black high school yearbooks, college yearbooks, black weddings, special occasions, and not just in Orangeburg. He gets pretty much of a statewide reputation. And so he does travel around the state, and it's uh, it's interesting. An event happens, and Cecil's there. Cecil's gifted in so many ways. Uh, He saw things that he could be at a time when it almost didn't exist. There were so few black photojournalists for a variety of reasons. Um, one would mm-hmm. obvious one would be that the black owned newspapers that were going to publish these photos were in the north. Another one was it was extremely dangerous during the civil rights movement, and you could not hide that you were a black photojournalist because you had an enormous camera around your neck or held up in front of your face. Um, L. Alex Wilson, who was the editor of the Tri-County Defender, was in Memphis for Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, Central High School desegregation. He was beat so severely that three years later he died of his injuries. So uh, there's there's danger that's restricting uh, black photojournalists. There's um, the lack of newspapers, and then there's the lack of pay. So in that point in time, you would take your film and you would mail it to who was interested, and they might pick out a picture and you might earn, you know, ten, twenty five dollars for a whole day's work. And that's why Cecil was like many other black photographers also having a studio. So when you think of black uh, photography studios, they were usually for portraits. And Cecil began taking portraits in the 50s when he was in uh, high school. Uh, He would rent a room at a house and put all his photo equipment there and put up curtains and take a photo. And then as he finished college, he opened his first photo studio downtown. He He had mentors who were helping him with this craft. One of them was Edward E.C. Jones, Jr., who was uh, stationed in, uh, that's my military brat background there saying stationed, who lived in, <laughs> in Sumter, South Carolina, and had a studio there. And he took Cecil to Summerton, for example, for the Briggs versus Elliott photos. And then Cecil inherited his post as the HBCU, Historically Black College and Universities, photographers for annuals and special events, which was a steady income. So Cecil is ever present. I'm just thinking about his getting photographs to the wider world. He tried sending photographs to some of the black newspapers with limited success, but it was with Jet Magazine that he really began to get his national publicity for South Carolina. Yes, he was uh, published um, in the Afro-American 
which had five newspapers, uh, and very occasionally in the Pittsburgh Courier. Sometimes those papers would send a journalist down to report, and Cecil would go out with that person. But Jet Magazine made him what was then called a stringer, or you could say freelance photographer, in 1956. There's a beautiful letter in the book in which they tell him what a proud core he is joining. And he would send film to them. And uh, he got, for example, during the 55, 56 boycotts, he got a what was then called a center spread in a magazine where there are like six or seven pages of story and photographs. He was on the cover, or Coretta Scott King, the widow of Martin Luther King. Uh, her portrait was on the cover of Jet Magazine when he covered the Charleston Hospital strike. Um, one of the catches here is that very often both the magazines and the newspapers did not give what we used to call a photo credit. So there would not be a name under the photograph. So if you didn't keep good records yourself, and if you didn't peruse these publications, you uh, might not know until you got a paycheck that a picture had been used. And so it's it's rather difficult doing research. Uh, one of the ways I could locate Cecil's photographs was that newspapers.com, God bless them. Um, he would tell me about an event he had photographed, what he the picture was. For example, Gloria Blackwell Rackley, who was a, a leader, a school teacher that was a leader uh, in Orangeburg. And I would go look in that time period and find that photograph. So it is uh, rather difficult to locate and document um, photographs from black photojournalists. Well, I remember a conversation I had with him earlier on the journal. And it's not exaggeration. There may be more than a million photographs he did over time. It's not an exaggeration, no. And Getty Images, which you know is very prestigious, uh, decided a few years ago to give $500,000 to five historically black colleges and universities. Claflin was one, and the goal with Claflin is to digitize Cecil's photographs. And for Getty, one of the goals is to, as they have documented the college life in the 30s or 40s or 50s of white-only colleges and universities to now um, do that for HBCUs. And then, of course, there are Cecil's civil rights uh, photographs. Well, you mentioned Claflin, and uh, Cecil is a graduate of Claflin. Right. And some folks may not realize that Claflin University and South Carolina State, their campuses are adjacent. They're in Orangeburg. And they were tied together historically. Uh, yes. Yes. I think the important thing to say here is a story about Cecil, which was that he expected to go to South Carolina State University, and Bitter Turner was not happy with him because of his coverage of the campus protest. And so a scholarship that had been offered Cecil was withdrawn. Um, but then uh, an equal scholarship was deliberately offered from Claflin. We're going to have you here, and we're going to match every dollar. <laughs> and um, But Benner Turner did turn around later and, um, and did hire Cecil in later years. Okay. And for Cecil being there, he had an interesting connection with John F. Kennedy. Yes, I mentioned that Cecil and his family would go to New York. So he was up in New York. He would often go not just to visit family, but also to go to the photo stores there and actually worked at some of the New York photo stores in the summer. And he saw that Kennedy was going to be speeding at the Roosevelt Hotel, which is a very fancy, expensive hotel in New York at that point in time. He went to take pictures for Jet as a freelancer and was stopped in the lobby. He was the only black person entering the lobby, and he was stopped. And the security guards were escorting him out as not yet President Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, and his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, walked in. And Kennedy stopped them and asked what was going on. Cecil pled his cause, and Kennedy escorted him to the very front row. Cecil said this was fortuitous because he didn't have his long lens, and all the photographers were at the very back of this enormous ballroom. And so he got to sit next to uh, Huntley and Brinkley, who were a news TV reporting team, and photographed Kennedy. Kennedy gave him his private phone number, and when Kennedy came down here to, uh, to South Carolina to camp campaign. Uh, Cecil got a ride on uh, his private jet. He was the first candidate to use his own private plane. So they had, uh, they developed a relationship. Again, it, it's amazing, almost Forrest Gump-like. <laughs> Cecil is there, but it's because as a youth, as a photographer, as you mentioned, 
six, seven, eight years old with his brownie, he seemed to sense what was going on, and he wanted to photograph that. Sometimes he was asked. A lot of times he just went, as in the Kennedy situation. He has an amazing energy and many, many gifts. It's one of the reasons I wanted so much to work with Cecil. He he never stops. And he, he says that he is somewhat obsessive. He gets a focus of something he's going to do, and he is going to do it as long, well as 15 other things that day. <laughs> uh, really high energy person and also very gifted in a lot of different directions. He was fascinated by cars. In fact, he's going to do, his, uh, he says his next photo book is going to be all the cars he owned. And so he designed a car for a car contest for children and placed in it. He thought about being an architect. Uh, Clemson was the only place in state where you could go to architectural school. He applied with the hopes that if he didn't get to Clemson, that the state would send him elsewhere, which they often did. They would send students to other states to avoid desegregation. Um, He didn't get that opportunity. And so he taught himself architecture. And later in his life, he built three modern, that's capital M. It's a style, sort of a, a blocky kind of house with lots of windows, very modern style. He built three modern houses with his designs, and one of them is now the Cecil Williams South Carolina Civil Rights Museum, which is the only museum right now that's dedicated to civil rights in South Carolina. And he's the person who's collecting and labeling uh, all the items that are in that museum. So he's still, by the way, he was born in 1937. He's still photographing creates this museum. As you can see, uh, he's living in one of the houses he built, sold one of the houses he's built, has, putting a museum in another house he built. He's a man of many talents. Well, and of course, he's 87. That's right. You did the math. <laughs> I did. <laughs> he's the same age as my older brother. <laughs> uh, Cecil's busily trying to go through his catalog, I understand, isn't he? And trying Well, to... with the digitization, um, there is an effort to, to identify. identify. Yeah. And this was difficult uh, when we were putting together the book because there were, there were times where I just didn't think that was the right date or there were two black activists who looked very much alike. And we would we would mm. debate over is this person A or is this person B, right? Um, and so th- there is a, a really strong effort in this book to identify people and also to have accurate dates. And I think that is very important. But I would say as a writer that if I have some general idea, it really does help me. I don't have to have maybe all the information that a historian would desire, that the pictures can still be of service to me because I see the facial expressions, I see the clothes, I see the stores that are no longer there, the streets that are no longer there. I can get a feel for, for what it's like. And I think of this book, um, Injustice and Focus, as a, a portrait of, of a rare being, a, photo, a black photojournalist who's documenting the civil rights movement, but also a portrait of Orange Burke, which was so active in the civil rights movement. And, um, and there are lots of entry points to conversations about what that town was like what the people white and black in that town were like, how people dressed the cars they drove. Uh, there's um, a picture that Cecil loves when Thurgood Marshall came to visit. Uh, this was, I think, in 55, and he's come to the Claflin gym to speak. And Cecil took a picture of the parking lot. And you've got lots of really great-looking 1940s cars with that rounded shape, you know. <laughs> I hate to say this, but we need to start wrapping up. All right. Any last words or particular story you'd like to pass on to our listeners before we sign off today? I think I'd like to uh, briefly explain <laughs> Justice and Focus. It is a, a book that has 80 absolutely beautiful photographs that Cecil took. And I was always interested um, in black and white photography. And I've got to tell you that Cecil is a master in uh, exposing film, which was biased towards white skin properly. So you could see the beautiful tonal ranges of black skin, you know, from gold to brown to darker brown. And I think that this book's printing does honor to that. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy that I could uh, write about someone still living (laughs) who has such a rich life that's beneficial to all of us in terms of how he documented the civil rights movement. 
And I think this book does a good job, I hope, of, of showing uh, this remarkable human being in the environment that he was in then and giving people a better idea of how extraordinarily difficult it was to be black in South Carolina in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, which are the decades that we, f- we focus on. Okay. And as we said earlier in our conversation, in microcosm, it really is a story of the civil rights movement in Orangeburg, South Carolina, which was the center of organized resistance, began before World War II and continued uh, into the 1960s and 70s. Yes. Uh, well, I used to t- talk about this as a, as a writing professor, to think about the microcosm and the macrocosm. And so there's the macrocosm of the world, you know, post-World War II or pre-World War II. There's the, the nation and what's happening with the nation. And then there's the state of South Carolina. And then we've honed in on Orangeburg. And Orangeburg is a rich way to tell the story of the civil rights movement because of the black activists and the white resistance. And Briggs versus Elliott, such an important lawsuit happened just a few miles away. So it is a story of a town as well as a person and that person in that town to expand out into the, the macrocosm of the civil rights movement. It's just this wonderful universe there. Well, Claudia Smith Brunson the author of Injustice in Focus, The Civil Rights Photography of Cecil Williams. Thank you so much for being with us again on The Journal. Oh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's journal. I know that I did. Cecil Williams' story is unique. He was there in South Carolina to witness and document pivotal moments in the struggle for civil rights. Together with his remarkable photographs and Claudia Smith Brinson's research, interviews, and writing, Injustice in Focus brings alive an important chapter in the history of South Carolina and the nation. Walter Edgar's Journal is a production of South Carolina Public Radio. I'm Alfred Turner, and I produce the show, which is made possible by listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. Remember, the views and opinions expressed on Walter Edgar's Journal are not necessarily those of South Carolina Public Radio or its underwriters. New episodes of Walter Edgar's Journal are published on the first and third Fridays of the month and are available at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org on the SCETV app, as well as your favorite podcast provider. We'll talk again soon. Mm-hmm.